My name's Mike Ellis. I have a problem. I rescue, refurbish, restore and revitalise vintage drums, in particular Premier drums. In this programme I'll share with you my adventures, ups and downs, ins and outs, triumphs and tragedies as I lavish some TLC on vintage British drums. Welcome to The Drum Fettler. Hi, welcome to the Drum Fettler. This is where we find, fix, fettle and fumble vintage drums. In this programme we're going to be looking at the Premier 392 50 ton socket. Much misunderstood and maligned, but we'll talk you through it. And the vastly underrated Premier 1005 snare drum. A snare drum that punches way above its weight. Now if you're tired of the brutality and childishness and infantile antics of online drum forums and Facebook pages, etc, etc, then you've come to the right place, because here you'll find nothing but sophisticated discourse. <coughs> Was that okay? But first, let's take a look at the poor relation in the drum world. The Concert Tom. <coughs> we have here the new project, Premier Concert Toms. As you can see, we've got a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and 18 in the very fetching silver star finish. These drums are from around 1975 from what I can tell. They are mahogany shells, which means that they're going to be quite a bit warmer sounding than birch shells, which people are used to having with vintage Premier drums. But obviously, because they are single-headed concert toms, they have a greater bark, if you like. What we're going to be doing with these is we're going to be putting a resonant head on each one. It's not an uncommon conversion. I've done quite a few myself. So why do we have concert toms in the first place? In 1974, Premier, like all the other major manufacturers, capitulated to fashion and started producing single-headed concert toms. There were initially six available, obviously utilising the existing double-headed sizes and method of manufacture. In 1978, the single-headed concert tom selection was expanded with the addition of a 6x6, 8x6 and 10x7 drums. Curiously, this made Premier unique in as much that they offered nine single-headed concert toms, whilst most, if not all, other companies offer the traditional eight. Now pay attention. This is the 39250 Tom Holder socket. Fits to the bass drum, introduced around 1974, and was pretty much a standard on many kits. However, it is much maligned and very much misunderstood because it was invented by engineers and then given to drummers. Which means that one of the problems it had was it would split. Now I've got one here. I don't know if you can see, there's some cracks there. Now these splits occurred because some drummers, not all of them, some drummers are slab-handed morons and would over-tighten everything, including these, and this caused the casting, the top casting, to split. And the reason they would split was because of one of these often referred to as a butterfly clip. Well, it is neither a butterfly nor is it a clip. It is a 39254 protector. Now, what does the protector do, I hear you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Hey. Yes. Thank you. The reason the 39250 often cracked was because this protector was often missing. The way it worked was, the outside hand nuts would be tightened to hold the tom holder, which fitted in here, in place. Inside the casting was the protector. Now, it was held in place on this pin. Now, sometimes this pin would get broken off and the protector would fall out and therefore the problems would start to arise. The protector would fit in here, like so. And then, when the hand nuts were tightened up, would press against the protector, pushing it up against the oval tube, and thus spreading the load 
around the area of the protector jaws. Coupled with the back plate, this would hold the tom holder firmly in place. But unfortunately, if this pin broke and the protector went missing, or worse still, the protector was not fitted in the first place, these hand nuts would then tighten directly against the oval tube of the tom holder. I've got one here, and you could probably see down here all these dings in the tube. The hand bolts will be tightened even tighter and tighter in order to stop the tom holder from slipping. Which is why, if you've got one of these, you must make sure that you've got your protector in place. If you find yourself in the situation where you've got a 39250 tom holder socket and it is cracked and the protector's missing, you can replace it. The later rock lock holder will fit. You just need to make the oval hold a little bit bigger to accept the round post. And of course you need to get the rock lock holder to go with it as well. But fortunately the rock lock tom holders use the same diameter alarms as the earlier Lockfast tom holder. So you shouldn't have any problems in that respect. But sometimes if these aren't cracked too badly and you have got your uh, protector in place they will still work but you just have to be fairly careful and not get too over enthusiastic with tightening them up alternatively you could dispense with the socket completely as many people do and mount the rack tom on a tom stand you may not want to have the holder left there useless with the hand nuts rattling around in there so what I've got here is something that I've been selling for a little while now it's a stainless steel blank plate uh, this is just the covering that peels off to reveal the shiny bit underneath. So you can take off your 39250. You need to keep the bottom part, this U-shaped back plate, and the coach bolt and the felt pad as well. And I also do them in a variety of matching colours. don't have every single vintage Premier colour available. We do have some. We've got Black Pearl there, White Marine Pearl, Polychromatic Red, Polychromatic Copper, there's a Mahogany Duro Plastic. An alternative there for you, just have a look at the website and I'm sure we can sort you out with your Tom Holder Hole disguising needs. Do you know what this is? It's part number SP0805-046 and it looks like a big spring. Do you know what it is? Well if you do, can you let me know? Because I haven't got a bloody clue. People often say to me, now, let's not cause a scene sir, we've got a taxi waiting for you outside. People often say to me, which is better, a concert tom or a regular tom? Well, it's very much down to taste and the application of whatever music you're playing. I think really what needs to be done, rather than deriding one as being less musical or unfashionable, is treat them as completely different instruments. I use concert toms for different effects, different sounds, whereas the regular double-headed toms are more conventional. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a set of concert toms in your drum armoury for those moments where you need something with a little bit more poke, aggression perhaps, or if you just like 70s disco. I digress. The pros and cons of concert toms against conventional double-headed toms is academic in this case because of these babies are going to get resonant heads. If you find yourself in need of premier parts, and let's face it, who doesn't, pop along to the website. There's hundreds and hundreds of bits there. Even if you can't see what you need, drop me a line through the contact form and uh, we'll see if we can sort you out. Also goes for Beverly drums, hammer drums and of course Olympic. In its illustrious history, Premier has made a number of iconic snare drums. The Super Ace, the Royal Ace, the 2000, the HR9, the 35 and many others. But I'd just like to take a quick look at one of their more modest and understated offerings. The 1005. We've got one here. It's a nice example from around 1980-81. Simplicity itself. Originally launched in the 60s as the Olympic 1005, it stayed in production in one form or another for over 35 years. 
beaten only in longevity terms by the legendary 2000. This is my 1005. It needs a bit of a clean, but as you can see, it's from a similar era from the one that I'm going to be fettling. The badge is the same, but it's slightly later because it's got the larger vent hole. But the eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed that this has got the 120 lugs rather than the 10520 lugs. Now these lugs I put on as a personal preference instead of the 105 lugs. They were in fact actually issued as standard in the 90s so if you've got a 90s 1005 snare drum then chances are they've got these lugs. It's still got the original 1636 throw off although this on later models was replaced by the 0648 and the really eagle eyed will have noticed that it's got die cast hoops now again that's just personal preference I find it thickens up the sound a little makes it a little bit more focused and gives it a great deal more poke you gotta remember it's these shells were almost certainly the same shells that we used on the 2000 snare drum, the hi-fis and probably others as well so the quality of the build cannot be doubted because it's the same as the higher end ones and savings were made by using steel hoops, smaller lugs and well it's a little bit flimsy the throw off but it works uh, as long as you don't give it too much abuse it'll work for years. Right I think what we'll do now is we'll give this one a bit of a settle, a bit of TLC. First get those rods out. the bearing edge, make sure everything's okay. The snare side resonant head was subject to an earlier fettling. New head, clean off the unshka from the hoops. Get rid of those horrible lug locks off the tension rods. A little bit of lovely lube in the lugs. With the head, the hoop, in with the rods, quick tune up, a little fine tuning on the snare side, et voila! Settled, lovely nice head on it. See so, yeah, Everton's power centre. Sounds great. The prices belie their quality. I've seen these go for as little as 30, 40 pounds. Can go up to 65, 75 pounds. It's a wonderful backup snare, even a main snare. Now let's get cracking with those concert toms. As you know, the concert toms are going to be made into double-headed toms. Now, under normal circumstances, what I would do is I would fit a second set of these 43620 lugs staggered on the resonant side. However, the client doesn't want that. They want the original look of the high tension Premier lug, specifically the 44020 lug. So they will be something like that. Now this does mean that there will be some extra holes to deal with, but we'll talk about that later. So what we'll be doing with the 12 and the 13 is we will be fitting those with the 44020 lugs. The 14, the 15, the 16 and the 18 obviously being deeper leaves a great deal more room for another set of the 43620 lugs to go around the bottom. So that's what we're going to be doing with those. But these, we need to take them apart and think about tidying up the inside of those shells as well.
side of the toms, I don't know if you can see, are a little bit, a little bit scabby. This is because back in the day, one of the selling points uh, of the concert toms was you could put them inside each other. Now, this was okay when you had a, a drum that was fitted with a spade tom holder, like this. That's a 70 spade mount, which some of you may remember. It doesn't really add a lot to the profile of the drum, so they could fit inside each other, and it gave you the opportunity to put a little bit of protection around the outside. But as we know, and love, Premier had these big 39235 tom mounts on the side, which added, well, another sort of two and a half, three inches to the diameter of the drum and also this big hand nut did all sorts of nasties to the uh, inside of the shells but I think what we'll do is I will deal with the inside of the shells later because the other thing I've got to look at is there is some damage to the wrap here and I've got an idea how I'm going to try and sort that out the first thing to do is look at the positioning of the lugs. So, if we measure the shell, we see that the bearing edge to bearing edge is about 200mm, which means on the 12 inch centre hole falls just above the bottom hole of the original hole for the 43620. Now we knew we were going to have to do some filler work so that's okay because that means the plug is about there. Externally not only will it cover both the holes, but it will cover, you can see, the print of the 436 lug. Yeah, it pretty much covers it completely. So that's a bit of good news. Uh, that's the 12 inch. The 13, let's just check this is the 13. Now that is just about 220, 223, so, oh, I've already got a mark on my uh, steel ruler here, showing where the hole is, so, uh, some history there, it's obviously done this job before. So again, it's the same story, it's just a little bit off. So if we... But I'm quite tempted, you know, to use the existing hole. Because we are talking a difference of just a few millimetres. That's where the log would end up. I think it's going to have to be new holes. It's going to have to be new holes if we're going to do the job properly. So yeah, I think we're on to a winner here. Tremendous. I think what I'm going to do is when drill this and then we'll look at repairing the external wrap. Still going to think that one through. What is it? It's a 14 by 12 marching snare. Been knocking around the workshop for a while, decided it's going to become a 14 by 12 resonator snare. Already started work on it, got the white marine pearl wrap done, it's got a nice 0632 strainer on it, and a matching butt plate. 
Why should I do such a crazy thing, I hear you ask? Why would you do such a crazy thing? Are you mad? Well, maybe a little bit unhinged. But this is a project for another episode of The Drum Settler. Well, what fine, fulsome, fettling fun we've been having, eh? Well, that's just about it from this edition of The Drum Fettler. I'm going to relax now with a little fizzy and uh, one of my five a day. Hope you can join me in the next episode of The Drum Fettler, where we'll be continuing with the concert on conversion. Hopefully there'll be another project, who knows? And we'll uh, take a look at some other old premier parts, history, for your enjoyment. Hope to see you then.